Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us once again. Um, we are here for the workshop, Creating Successful Leadership Transitions. And we have one of our own, JT Aldridge, with us today, um, which will go over this um, workshop and presentation with you. Just a few quick reminders that we can't see you. So if you're raising your hand or waving at us, I'm sorry, my apologies on that. Please be using the chat. If you want any comments on there, um, right under that is the questions tab. So be sure to place your questions on there. And then the third one, JT does have two poll questions. So he'll put those on there. Just kind of watch for the red button um, or for the red dot on it so that you'll remember to go back in there and he'll remind you about that. Okay. All right, JT, I'll leave it to you. Go ahead and let him know who you are as well. All right, thank you, Brenda. Howdy, y'all. Great afternoon. I hope that you have enjoyed the conference so far and learned a few things that you can uh, take back along the way. So as Brenda said, I am JT Aldrich, and I'll be your host for this workshop today, Creating Successful Leadership Transitions. And I want to start off with just a little bit about me and, and sort of why me for this presentation or this workshop. So the first thing that I would tell you about myself is that I'm a Christian. And in fact, in my local church, I am a non-vocational pastor. So that's just a fancy way of saying that I'm a volunteer pastor. Uh, I don't get paid and it's not my full-time job. And I'll tell you what my full-time job is a few bullets down, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a husband of the lovely Mrs. Aldridge for 18 years now, and we have three lovely children, so I get to be a father to a 13-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and I love every minute of it. We, we spend a lot of our time traveling around to volleyball games and practices, and Boy Scout uh, camp outs and meetings, and of course all of our church activities. So we're your typical busy family of five, and I am in, just by the way, I am in the city of Fort Worth, so uh, I am a professional engineer, and my specialization or the area that I focus on is reconstructing streets and roadways and you know sidewalks and curb ramps and things like that and i love uh i love doing that because it, it it makes our community a better place and i really i really love being a part of that i feel like you know a brand new street brand new sidewalks really uh, brings up the curb appeal of any any neighborhood so uh, I love getting to be an engineer and work on streets, improve streets all around the city of Fort Worth. And I'm also a, a vice president of education of my Longhorn Toastmasters Club. That's a local club in Fort Worth. And you can even go online and look us up. And that's actually how I became, uh, how I was asked through, through my Toastmasters involvement to present today's workshop. So... Uh, you'll see the, the presentation, you know, is branded with Toastmasters International. And if you don't know about Toastmasters, I'll tell you just two things. There, there's two primary goals of Toastmasters, the organization, and it is to improve public speaking skills, like what I'm doing right now, and to increase confidence in public speaking. And so for me, I've been involved for almost four years, and my... My skill in speaking publicly and my uh, my uh, confidence is is just soared, is skyrocketed in the three or four years that I've been involved with Toastmasters. So uh, I love it. That's how I got involved with with Nusa today, and I highly recommend it if it's something that you're interested in uh, in improving your uh, your communication skills and especially just getting more comfortable speaking in front of people, I recommend it. So the last couple items there, you know, you can see, you can tell I'm a, I'm a pretty busy guy, but the last couple items there, if I have any time left, and when I do have some free time, those are the things that I love to do just for me. I love do-it-yourself projects around the house. I love maintaining the yard 
and, and just taking care of the house. I'm always fixing furniture that's been broken by the kids or some of their toys that have been broken. So uh, tinkering around in the yard and, and in the garage and just around the house and doing, doing all kinds of little projects, you know, light switches and fans and a little bit of plumbing. I mean, I like to do a little bit of everything. And I'm a, a huge football fan. And in the summer or in the fall and in the winter time, you will generally find me on Sunday afternoons watching the NFL football games. Uh, so I love doing that. Um, the reason that, that I believe that I can share some good tips with you today is because of uh, the last 15 years or so of my life, I've held many volunteer positions in my church and with uh, Boy Scouts of America and in the Toastmasters Club that I mentioned. So I think that I've had, I've had lots of transitions in leadership where I've been transitioning into or where I've been transitioning out of a leadership position in these various organizations. So I'll share some stories with you today, uh, hopefully, as long as we have some time. So we're, we're going to follow this outline today. And so I do want to remind you, and, and Brenda mentioned this earlier, if you have a question, specifically a question, use the question feature, you know, instead of the chat, try to use the question feature and type your question in there. And you can do that anytime. So, so as I'm talking along, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in there. And then when we come to the end of the workshop, we'll, we'll have time for Q&A. And we'll go through those questions and we'll make sure that we, we answer all of them. That way we capture everything there. But also feel free to chat. Chat it up in the chat function while I'm talking. Uh, don't expect me to be paying attention to the chat the whole time. I'm pretty well focused right here on talking to you. But I will look back over the chat. I would love for you to, if, if something I say resonates with you, I'd love for you to just chat it in there. Uh, at that point in time, and I'll go back and look at the comments later, or if something is unclear, or if I could do a better job of explaining something, uh, put it in there for me. I would. I love feedback. That's another big thing about Toastmasters. I love to get feedback because I want to improve and I want to do better. So while we are on the this, this subject a little bit of the virtual the meeting room here, uh, I want you to go ahead and look at the files feature. So I put some files in there for you. And uh, the first one, this is the one I actually want you to go and download right now. It's called Takeaways, all right? It's titled Takeaways. On mine, at least, it's at the very bottom. I guess it's in uh, alphabetical order. No, nah, it's not even alphabetical. I'm not sure what it is, but it's uh, it's called Takeaways. Download that. So I made it. I made it. It just it looks it looks kind of like this, and you can download that and you can take some notes. So it's got a space for you to type in your notes. It's a PDF, and you can download a computer and you can type in some notes, your top three takeaways uh, while I'm talking today. So you got a place to capture your notes. And then it's also got a handful of questions on the bottom of it, and that's something that I'm going to talk about. It's one of my tips that I'll offer you. And so I've got it printed there already, so you've got an easy download that you can save for that. So go ahead and do that um, as I keep kind of moving along. All right, so now we're going to go, we're going to start off with a, just a, a fun poll, just to have a little bit of fun. So I want to just get some feedback from you and just kind of figure out who's, who's listening. And I want to know what best describes your role in your organization. Now, we're going to have fun with this. I'm going to turn the, I'm going to turn the poll on. So just have fun with this. Remember, I told you that I'm a, I'm a pastor. So I got a little biblical reference here for you. And so just pick one of these answers. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't matter if none of them fit you. Pick one that describes you now, one that you hope describes you in the future, or one that uh, that maybe describes you in the past that, that you can say, oh, okay, I was I have experience with this. So go over to the poll feature and if it hopefully it lit up with a little red, a little red dot, and you'll see the question there. And you just click on the answer, the one that, that best uh, best describes you. So I've got, um, you can see on there, you know, I've got the Moses leader. Uh, and so Moses in the Bible was this great, long time, super successful leader. Um, and in this case, we're going to, we're going to say Moses is the outgoing leader. So maybe that's you in your organization. Maybe you've been 
you've been there for, for decades or just many, many years, and you are ready to transition out. You know, you're ready to be an outgoing member or, or leader, and maybe that describes you. And so that's fine, you know, put that there. Uh, I, I think all of us aspire to be the Moses leader. But also, maybe you're a Joshua. Maybe you're an incoming leader. You're relatively new. Um, so in the Bible, Joshua took over from Moses. And Joshua was trained very well by Moses. In fact, for, for many years, Joshua was training underneath Moses and learning. So when Joshua became the leader, it was not a surprise. He was ready for it. He, he was full of confidence, and he was ready to take it on. So maybe that describes you. Uh, so that's okay. That's a great one. Now you got the King Saul leader. Uh, this is one where, you know, we're having a little fun with this. King Saul in the Bible was unsuccessful. He was not a great leader. He was the first king of Israel, and uh, he actually was, was basically forced out, and the kingship was taken away from him and given to someone else. And... Uh, from that point on, King Saul was jealous, and in fact, he tried to kill his successor many times. So, you know, I hope that's not you. <laughs> and so far, I don't see anybody voting on that one, so that's good. But you may, you may, you know, you may know of someone like that, someone who's being forced out. You may have seen this before in the past. Someone who is uh, maybe voted out, not reelected, uh, and they can become uh, jealous. So. Uh, and then the last leader, the last vote there that you can make is the Gideon leader. So Gideon in the Bible was a guy who was uh, was hiding, and when he was uh, when he was approached to be the leader to step up, he uh, protested and he resisted and he hesitated and he asked for several signs and he wanted to be sure. Um, so basically, he just was full of low confidence. Um, he didn't think that he could do it. He thought he was from the the smallest, the most, least important clan and the least important tribe of, of the whole nation. And he just didn't feel like he was the right person. And, you know, maybe that's you. Or, again, maybe you've experienced that with someone or you felt like that before. Uh, Gideon, you know, was not prepared to be a leader yet. And he was sort of thrust into it. And uh, that could be you. So, all right, most most people, I'm sure you can see the results. Most, most of the results are... A long time outgoing leaders. All right, so uh, that's that's kind of good because it gives me an idea of you know most of you are are outgoing leaders or you're you're preparing to transition out. So I'll see if I can if I can uh, you know talk to the to to, to the you a little bit as as uh, as the audience today. So all right, here's the meat of today's workshop. This is what you came for. We're going to talk about the three phases of leadership transition. The, uh, how to have a good ending with the outgoing leader, how to have a smooth handoff, and how to have a powerful beginning with the new incoming leader. And the objectives today, here's the thing, the number one thing that I hope today, I hope that you're able to take away uh, at least one tip that you can implement immediately. Uh, I think you'll be able to do that. I think there's something here for everybody today. And the other thing that I want you to notice as I talk through these tips is that um, planning ahead is, is crucial. And in fact, I really believe if you don't plan ahead for, for a leadership transition, it can be detrimental to your organization. And I don't want that to happen to you. So you came here today to learn about creating successful leadership transitions. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on tips to, to help you have success in your leadership transitions. All right. We'll keep moving along here. All right. So a group project. Now, I want to know how you felt when you first saw those words pop up on the screen, group project. Or maybe back when you were back when you were in, uh, in school, in, in high school, or in college, or in some training class, and they said, all right, we have a group project. I want to know, how did you feel? So this is another poll. Go to your poll feature. I've, I've turned on another poll for you. And I want to know, were you excited? 
or are you terrified? Hey, and there's no right or wrong answer there. Just you're, you're, you're excited, you're that kind of person. Oh, yes, we get to work together. I get to talk to some other people and interact. Or you're, you're that, oh, man, you know, your shoulders kind of slumped and you're like, oh, seriously, a group project, you know. You might be thinking it's Friday afternoon and it's you know almost four o'clock and I've been at this conference for several days and you know I'm just I'm ready to be done. I'm tired of talking to people. Whatever it was, just type it in there. Again, we're just having a little fun with these polls. I, I love that we have this access to take the polls. So I'm just curious to see. All right, man, a lot of you are excited. Well, um, like it or not, what what I'm about to say, it looks like most of you are gonna like what I'm about to say, that uh, we're not actually doing a group project. That was just a test. We, you, uh, I want you to think about uh, community leadership is a group project, right? And I know you all know that. So it is, it is just like a group project. It takes uh, lots of people. It takes a community, right? It takes multiple people uh, to, to, to pull off and to handle, you know, community leadership. And so in the same way that Community leadership is like a group project. Uh, I want to I want to talk today like leadership transition is like a relay race. All right, so you're going to see that theme in the in the next couple of slides. It's like a relay race. So so transitioning leadership in your organization is just like a relay race. If you think about it, uh, no one member of a relay race can finish the race by himself. Right. It takes a team, it takes multiple people, and they take the baton, and, and they hand the baton one person to the next person. And each of them runs their race, right? They run their leg of the race, and then they pass the baton off, and they can encourage and support the rest of the runners, but they're not the focal point anymore, and, and they're not running and finishing that race. So as we move into... All right, so yeah, most of you, most of you checking the poll responses. Most of you are excited about group projects. That's probably a good thing. Um, you're happy about it. So we're gonna get into. I'll just leave that one open. You can keep voting on it. We're gonna get into uh, the first phase, right? The first phase of leadership transitions, which is a good ending with the outgoing leader. And our first tip today is celebrate the good. So here's the thing, if you're the outgoing and you're, at, you're an outgoing leader, I want you to affirm and celebrate the, uh, the value of your organization, all right? I want you to be sure that you know why is your organization valuable to your community. Um, you know, you, you're the, you're the spokesperson, right? For your, uh, if you're a leader, you're the spokesperson for your, your organization, your community. And, um, you need to, you need to know what's good. So uh, think about it like this. You might ask yourself the question, if our organization didn't exist at all, uh, what would the community be missing out on? You know, what is it? And if you answer the, that question, and you come up with a handful of things, you know, well, these, these are the things the community would be missing out on, then that's, that's the good stuff that you do. That's the value that you bring to the community. And so you want to talk about that. You've got to share that with others. You've got to, you've got to put that out there, right? So you want to celebrate the good. So I can, I can recall a, um, a, a transition that I made when I was becoming a deacon at my church. And the leader before me, he was, he was the Moses kind of leader. He was awesome. He was amazing. He was well spoken. He was a strong leader, and he was he was stepping down after several years of leading the deacon, uh, the deacon ministry in our church. And uh, he did an excellent job of this of celebrating the good, always reminding us as as deacons, always reminding our our group of of the good things that we did for the church. You know, always bringing up every meeting. In every email, always putting something out there. This is this is what we do. This is the value that we bring to our church. And he just he just did an excellent job of it. And 
Uh, in fact, you know, if, if you're very familiar with the Bible, you also know that Moses in the Bible did an excellent job of this as well. He constantly reminded the Israelites, the Israel people, that of all the good things that God had done for them, all of the wonderful things he had brought them out of slavery and helped them cross the Red Sea. And, you know, he was constantly reminding them of the good. The next one is... Um, maybe it's my most exciting tip for the day. Document roles and responsibilities. Now, it's, uh, it's, about, it's about as exciting as it sounds right there on the screen. Um, I know this is, this is not the most fun thing to do, but as an outgoing leader, you're in the best position to document, and I mean write down or type it up in a Word document, exactly what it is that you do all right, so if you're, if you're, what your role is, what your responsibility is with the organization. And uh, this is something, I've got some examples for you. If you go to the files section, so if you were there earlier, you saw there was, there was several files in there. And I've got some examples from Toastmasters, from our local club, of things like the president and the vice president and the secretary and treasurer. And those are some great examples of a place to start of, you know, the role and the responsibility for each of those positions. This is something great that you can simply hand out to people because if one of the first things all your volunteers are going to ask is, well, what's involved in that? Or, you know, what's expected of me if I do that? So this is a critical step in setting the expectations for any new or incoming leader that may come in the future. So you definitely need to sit down, and I told you earlier, I'm going to talk about planning ahead. This is one of those planning ahead things. You have to plan ahead to make this happen because uh, this is, uh, it takes time. It takes time to think through what you do. Uh, I did this also uh, when I was on the deacon ministry, and we didn't have anything documented. And I sat down, and I did this very thing. We had, we had three officer positions, and I typed it up into a document what was the responsibility of each of the positions because I was asked multiple times by by other deacons, uh, well, what what exactly you know if I get elected secretary, what do I have to do? You know what's expected of me, and and so I realized like this needs to be written down and typed up so I can just hand it to them and say this is it. So next tip, uh, are you an overly generous giver? You know, somebody who uh, who helps everyone else and helps meet everyone else's needs and then never asks for what you really need? Well, if you're thinking, yeah, stop it. All right, just stop. You could be so much more productive if you... Uh, if you would say no from time to time, or if you will ask for the help that you need, you could be so much more productive, right? Um, I show this to you because, you know, there's research that shows that people will only help you if you ask, right? So if you're an outgoing leader and you're looking for new volunteers, and new, new leaders and people to step up, uh, I really will ask you, I mean, think hard about, have you actually asked for help or ask for new leaders. Now, uh, I got a couple things, I'll, points I'll make on this. And uh, so one is you've got to do it the right way. So if you send out a, a newsletter or a blast email to all of your members and say, you know, we, we sure need somebody to take up secretary role. Uh, that's not the right way to ask. So that's not the kind of ask I'm talking about. Uh, you will get far better results asking someone one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face and I know that's harder. I know it's so much easier to put it in your email and just hope that somebody responds. But the statistics show that uh, most of the time, people will not show up to help you uh, unless you ask, right? They can see that you're buried and they will just kind of walk on and assume that, well, you must like it that way or you got it. So, uh, so ask for help. Here's another thing is, Go back, so these workshops from the whole conference, they're gonna be on demand. Go back and watch one, it was called uh, Volunteer Recruitment and Retention. So it was, it was um, I don't know, it was this morning. Go find that one. They talk about this whole point, about how to 
how to recruit new volunteers, and they got some great uh, examples and some great strategies for doing that. So I encourage you to go find that workshop. Uh, and it was from Melinda and Nikki, and they're from Boise. And so they did a great job. I loved it. And they, they, can, they can really dive deep on this point right here, how to ask for new leaders. All right. So let's keep on moving. A smooth handoff. So when I talk about the handoff, I want to I want to kind of set it up for you. I'm talking about a window of time. So when when there's actually a transition that's going to happen now. So there's a there's an outgoing leader and a, and a new incoming leader, and within a few weeks of that official transition date, um, you need to schedule a meeting between the outgoing and the incoming leader. So this is something that I have experienced both in, 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 on the good side of having a meeting in my, again, in my deacon transitions, when I was transitioning into chairman of the deacons, I met with the outgoing chairman. And likewise, when I transitioned out of being the chairman, I met with the incoming chairman. And those face-to-face those -face meetings were invaluable. And it's a, it's a simple, I mean, you can have a schedule a lunch with them during the week or, or breakfast on Saturday or coffee on Saturday. There's, there's got to be a time for an hour or two where you can schedule time to sit down, just the two of you, the, the outgoing and the incoming, to sit down and talk through uh, some things. And so this is, uh, this is kind of where you get to be transparent. So if you're the outgoing leader, uh, in this situation, I want you to be, be absolutely transparent with this new incoming leader about what uh, issues and struggles and challenges your organization has faced. So uh, everyone may not know about these, these issues or these challenges. There may be some things that, you know, that, that have been kept amongst maybe the leadership team and, and you don't want the incoming leader to be blindsided by something like this. So. Uh, share the situation, share what's, share what's going on, or share something that, that, that you haven't finished yet. Maybe your, your organization's been working towards something um, and it's not completed yet. And, and so be sure you share that as the outgoing leader uh, because you're, gonna, you're, you're letting the incoming leader know uh, what's important right, to the organization. It goes back a little bit to celebrating the good, um, but, but at the same time here, sometimes I know some things are not necessarily good. So be willing to share that. And if you're the incoming leader here, um, again, be transparent and be willing to say, you know, I don't know everything. Um, I, I don't have knowledge of this, or you know, I'm concerned about my lack of knowledge of something. And so be willing to say that to the outgoing leader, be willing to speak up and, and just be vulnerable and say, you know, this is what I don't know, and this is what I'm worried or concerned about, what I may need help with. Um, and this is the perfect time to do that. And so I've got a couple, like I said, I've got a couple stories, some, some good ones where I did this with my deacon uh, transitions, and, and it was great. We were able to share information and talk about, you know, some of the issues that were underlying that, that weren't really publicly known. Um, but I've got an example, too, of the way not to do it. So one time uh, I was in Boy Scouts. And our, uh, our, our scout pack had, had selected a new uh, scout master, basically, a new uh, cub master. He was going to be the, the leader of the cub scout pack for us. And he had agreed to do it. And there were, there were some of us parents who were also on the leadership team. And we had the first few meetings of the year. And our new leader didn't show up to the meetings. He was, you know, either he couldn't make it for work. I mean, there was something going on. And we, we had a couple meetings like that where he didn't show up. He didn't make it. And so we just assumed that he wasn't really interested in, in serving as the, the leader of the pack. And we assumed that, that he, you know, was too busy and didn't really want to. And, you know, we thought that his wife had convinced him to do it, right, had told him that he needed to. And he really didn't want to. So that was our assumption. Um, so you notice I said the word I used was an assumption, right? We didn't ask him. We just assumed. So us leaders, other leaders, adults, we started making the plans and we started, you know, planning things out and, and, and doing things that we thought needed to be done to, to keep the pack and keep things moving and making progress. And well, 
Come to find out a couple of months later, we, we us, us adult leaders, we find out that, um, that Chad, Chad was his name, that Chad was kind of upset with us and that we were uh, closing him out and we weren't including him. We weren't letting him be a leader like he had, you know, agreed to do. And uh, we were totally caught off guard. You know, we didn't communicate with him. Right. We just made an assumption. We didn't have a, a meeting, any kind of a transition meeting with Chad to, to go th over these things, and to tell him what the expectation was of him or, or you know, what we were thinking and expecting. So we didn't do that. And so that's a great example of how not to do it. Um, the, these, I, I guarantee you, uh, you know, a meeting in person, like I said earlier, is just invaluable. And so here are the questions to talk about. So you want to, you know, you want to be willing to go over these. These can be kind of tough questions for both outgoing and incoming. But these are the, the five questions, and these are on that handout that I gave you, the one called takeaways. So if you downloaded that, you've already got them on your handout. You don't need to uh, scribble them down really quick or anything. But uh, these are questions. I, I just I think these are really great questions. It, it allows the outgoing leader to, again, share some of the good things, some of the, uh, the goals that they've had, and share that with the, with the new incoming leader. Um, helps to pass things down, right? Things that, uh, that the organization has been doing for a long time, maybe events or activities that, um, that you as the outgoing leader want to see continued. And so it gives you a great opportunity to do that. So, So yeah, I think that covers us on, on the handoff. So we're gonna keep on moving to the last phase of a leadership transition is the powerful beginning with the incoming leader. All right, so this is, you know, the transition has been really made and now you've got the new leader. Um, and so we wanna, we wanna help support and so listen, uh, one of the things that I wanna encourage you, if you are the outgoing leader here, um, please don't just disappear. I have, you know, I've been involved in, in many organizations and I've actually seen a few times where the outgoing leader is so ready to be done being the leader uh, and they just can't wait that, I mean, the minute that, that they are finished, it's like, you know, they're out of there. And they're gone, and you never see them at another meeting. You never see them at another event, and they just disappear. So I tell you, um, as the outgoing, uh, as the outgoing leader, please don't do that. So offer time to answer questions and and provide support, and this specifically to the new leader or the, the new incoming leader. Make yourself available as an outgoing leader, because there's no telling what's going to come up, right? You know that as a leader yourself, there's no telling what this new leader is going to encounter in the future. And so instead of just bailing out and saying, well, good luck, you know, I hope you, hope you do well, um, to make a really successful transition, um, you as the outgoing leader need to continue to be involved. So again, I saw this a couple times in my, in my deacon leadership transitions at church. Uh, one particular one was um, in our in our deacon ministry, we have term limits. So you can only serve for a certain amount of time as a deacon and you have to take a, a sabbatical. Basically, you, you have to take a year off. And uh, I was serving as the deacon chairman and I knew that my sabbatical was coming up. And I actually stepped down from serving as a chairman the year before my sabbatical was up so that I would still be active at the meetings and, and involved with the ministry for a full year where there was a new chairman, a new leader in place, so that I could, could be there to answer his questions. And sure enough, all throughout the year, there are all, all these things that come up that, you know, situations that, that there's no way I could have briefed him on ahead of time. But when they come up throughout the year, I was still there. I was still active and engaged. And was able to tell him, well, this is how we handled it last year, or this is how I, you know, we've maybe handled it in the past, or a similar situation that we had. So that's the wealth of knowledge you have as an outgoing leader 
is that you know you've been through so many uh, situations, so many experiences as a leader that you know again your experience is just invaluable for uh, an incoming leader and. You know, likewise, in, in this stage for the incoming leader, be be willing to accept support. You know, if other people are, are willing to uh, help you and support you, you know, if you've got another uh, an outgoing leader who's there and who, who's willing to support you, you know, accept it. Um, don't, you know, just just one of those things. I mean, don't turn your back on, on the outgoing leader. You know, don't. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit in a little while, but don't let your ego get so, so far ahead of you, you know, uh, and grow so big that you don't think that you need any help or you don't think that you need support. So uh, so definitely as, as the incoming, you know, accept offers when, when people offer to support you. All right, this next one, this may be my favorite tip just, just because I have a picture that goes with it. So it might be my favorite one. And so poise. So I want you to, to kind of picture, if you will, uh, as, as this is for the incoming leader, right? If you're an incoming or you're a new leader at something, uh, really, I want to I want to really encourage you to uh, behave and, and conduct yourself with poise. And the best way that I can think of to describe that is to think about a duck. So if you picture a duck on a pond, just like this one on the screen, and, and so you picture this duck, what you see on the surface, above the water surface, is calm, peaceful looking. The duck's just kind of gliding through the water peacefully. You might see just a few little ripples, but generally speaking, it's all calm and, and quiet above the water. But if you could, like, if there was a way you could you know, take and dip your head down below the surface, you would see that that duck's feet are paddling, paddling, paddling. I mean, like crazy. They are going crazy underneath the surface to guide the duck wherever it wants to go. But above, it looks like all is calm and peaceful. So that's, that's, that's this piece of advice for called poise for you as a new leader. When you become a leader in an organization, most likely, and you are going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant. You know, you're trying to get a sip of water and it's just pouring at you. That's how much information is coming at you. It's overload. You can't take it all in. Your head may be spinning. And that may be how you feel, right? And that's, and that's probably going to be normal. But I encourage you during your meetings and, and at events and activities and out with, with your membership people, um, remember to act and behave with poise you know don't let them know that inside your head you're thinking about all kinds of things and you're solving problems and you know you're running through things in your head but on the surface and outwardly uh, show up with poise so that's my uh, encouragement there and my last piece of advice is to use the phone so this one is maybe my simplest one uh, a tip Use the phone is, you know, real simple, and it is exactly what it sounds like. I mean, I'm going to encourage you, if you're a new and incoming leader, call, make one phone call every week, right? at least one, but set a goal, make one phone call every week, and call either uh, another one of the leadership team of your organization just to talk with them, see how they're doing, um, you know, call one of the volunteers, or just simply call uh, just, just one of the members of your organization. I mean, someone who you know, even if they're not a, not a volunteer or they're not a, a member yet, um, give them a call once a week. And here's what you do on that call. You just listen. You know, you just ask them how they're doing or how it's going. Or maybe you prompt them with a question. Uh, how's, you know, what do they think? How do they think this is going in your, in your community or in, you know, in your organization? How do they think something's going? But Make that one call each week and listen. And so and here's the reason I put that on there, because, again, I, I saw, you know, I had a one really great experience with this. Um, and so, again, it goes back to my, my days uh, serving as a deacon, and I was I'm serving as the chairman. And we, uh, the, the deacon ministry, our, our, our group, we were faced with a, uh, a, a time where we, we either needed to make a change, 
change the way that we had always done something or stick with and keep doing it the way we had always done it. And, you know, so this was a, a, like a change management kind of thing. And my opinion, as, and I was the chairman, my opinion was that we needed to make a change, that we should change things. And, you know, as, as over, over a little bit of time, a couple of months, you know, and I had conversations here and there with people, and I, I found out that there were a handful of other deacons in, in the body who uh, did not think we should change things. They, they wanted to stick with things the way they were. Um, but because I felt really strongly that we needed to change things, um, I, I, this is what I did. I called every one of our deacons. There were about 15 at the time, and I called every one of them. Over, over time, over a couple of weeks, every, you know, every evening on my way home, I would call a couple, and I would just ask them, you know, what do they think about this issue? You know, should we change it? Should we stay the way it is? And I found out that there were a couple, two maybe, who felt pretty strongly about keeping it the way it is, and there were almost everybody else really didn't have a strong feeling one way or the other. They were willing to do either one. We can change it. That's fine. We can leave it the same. That's fine. And, uh, and that's how everybody felt. But the great thing was uh, we went into, we had our next meeting, and I, and I still believe that we needed to make this change. I believe, I still believe that it was it's the best thing long term for that group. And, and so I went in, and because I had called and talked to and listened to all of the, all of the other deacons, and I heard their concerns, I was able to make make a pitch for um, you know what the making this change that I thought we needed to make. I was able to make a really good, strong, successful pitch, and I was able to address the concerns of the couple uh, of deacons who wanted to keep it the same because I had listened to them and I had listened to why they wanted to keep it the same and you know kind of what their underlying reasons were and. I was able to address those concerns and make a really strong, successful pitch, and we voted to make the change, and the vote was unanimous. We all agreed, everyone agreed, and there really was no, no arguing, and nobody got upset, uh, which is a great thing, um, especially those of you who, who <laughs> attend church a lot, you may, be, you may be nodding your head, yeah, that's pretty amazing. There was no, uh, not any arguments, but um, we discussed it. But we ended up all agreeing that, you know what, it's, it's good to make the change. And, and I was able to, to speak to that because I had simply talked to people and, and listened to them. And so even if even the guys who probably still didn't really want to make the change, they may not have agreed that we needed to, um, they felt they knew that they were heard. You know, they knew that I had listened to them uh, and that I, that I had and I, they, their feelings and their opinions had been heard. And, and so then they were okay, and they got behind the, the final decision that we made. So, time to wrap it up. Um, so, I hope that, I, that like I said, that I, I pointed out and I, that I, um, you know, emphasized enough that uh, planning ahead is, is critical, you know, as the outgoing leader especially. It's critical for setting clear expectations. You know, you need to plan ahead. If you're going to ask for help, you need to, you know, I would tell you one of the first things to do is think of one person, you know, think of one person, one name, who you know, a volunteer who you, you want to ask to, to become volunteer or start volunteering. Just think of, you know, one person. But that takes planning ahead. That takes uh, finding the time. You know, I was thinking, I was thinking earlier in the week, um, what is what is what is the reason uh, that we're so busy these days? And you know, we all know it. It's it's this little thing right here that keeps us all crazy busy. You know, anytime I have two spare minutes sitting at the curbside waiting for my Chick Fil A order to come out, I grab my phone and I start scrolling through and looking at it. Um, we we are you know so distracted today in our in our society, and it's hard to stop and plan ahead. You know, that's what I'm getting at, even for me. And I love to plan ahead, but I find myself sometimes just thinking, oh, I'm just, I'm just taking it one day at a time. I can only think about today. And, you know, it's not really true. It's just that I, I, I'm distracted and I fill my time, my free spare time where I could be thinking and, and planning ahead. I fill that time with other things. So uh, it's critical to, to plan ahead for these things, especially for a leadership transition. Uh, if you want it to go smoothly and successfully. And 
the last thing that I want to just, just remind everybody is that, you know, remember why you or we do this. And it's for the community. So if you, uh, if you find yourself, you know, getting upset or, or uh, basically find your ego kind of growing because you've got, you got some authority or, or some power, I will tell you, you need to, you need to pump the brakes a little bit and, you know, stop and remember that it's about the community. And um, if you, if you genuinely care about the community, then, you know, these things, these, these successfully transitioning for, for leadership will be important. And like I said at the beginning, think about uh, this. What, what would your community be missing out on if your organization, if you didn't exist at all? Well, what would they miss out on, right? And so remember that everything that you do, all the, the work and, and the effort that you put in is, is for others and it's for your community. And with that, I hope there's still some of you here with me, but I'm ready for questions. Let's see. If y'all have questions, there isn't any questions on there. If you'd like, yeah. if they want to raise their hands, are you open to um, bringing a couple people in for a quick conversation? Absolutely. Yeah. If you have, if you have, uh, you want to come in, you bet. If you want, if somebody has questions and wants to just kind of collaborate, please raise your hand and I'll let you in here. Let's see. How does a leader, this is from Ms. Carol Ross, how does a leader know when it's time to move on and give someone else an opportunity to lead, not a leader for life? Hmm, how does a leader know when to, it's time to move on and give someone else an opportunity to lead? Oh gosh. Um, that, that's a hard question to have come up with an answer to. I know, you know, one of, I mean, one of my examples, uh, was, you know, when I served as the chairman of the deacons and I, and I stepped down a year early, um, to allow someone else to step in and be the leader so that I could be there to support them, you know, in that last year. And, um, so in that case, I guess, you know, it took just, just being aware and, and again, planning ahead, looking forward, you know, looking at as much as you can, trying to look forward for your organization and, uh, you know, try to try to kind of have that vision for the organization. And, you know, it might be something like uh, you might, you might look around your, for example, your neighborhood and, and, you know, simply look at the, at the demographics of, the community, right? And you know, look at the, the age and the, uh, and the, you know, just the family status and, and that kind of thing to see, um, to see if, if maybe it's time for you, you know, looking forward saying, you know, okay, I think our, our organization needs to go in this direction. And, and I'm not sure that I, I can take it there. I'm not sure that that's, that that's, you know, that that's where I'm going to take it or that's where I'm headed. Um, and, and that's, Gosh, I don't know. That's about the best, the best I can answer your question. I think is, is just, you know, trying to look towards the future and see what's out there in the future. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't feel like that was a great answer to your question, but. Do you thank you. Thank you. So, so part of it is, uh, you know, sometimes um, if, if I guess if there are no bylaws or anything, you know, for some of these organizations, you know, people can be reluctant uh, both to step into a position where they can volunteer, one, because, you know, am I going to have to do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> or the other might be somebody who just doesn't want to leave and relinquish that role. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> uh, I, I hear you. Um, I don't know. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> Okay. We kind of get that a lot too, though. Um, 
you know, our neighborhood associations, you know, they all have bylaws. They come up with them, you know, whether they were, um, you know, serving, it's been, you know, years or if they're just now getting started. Yeah. And so some of them will set those term limits. And, but at a certain point, I think some of them have a hard time keeping connected. Um, and then nobody kind of want, wants to step up. Right? right. And so it, and we have to kind of keep reminding them, you know, we're not just going to show up at people's meetings, but we have, you know, that kind of support. And if you need, um, you know, assistance, getting the word out there, you know, kind of refocusing on re-engaging, mm -hmm. then that's kind of what, you know, what, what we can do. But mm -hmm. um, I went to a meeting recently where, you know, everyone was kind of like, I don't know if I want to, you know, they're like, hey, our elections are, is there any nominations from the floor? And I could see that people wanted to, but they were kind of like, Mm, I don't know. And so it was just kind of like, hey, just a reminder, we're here to guide you and help you through it. Um, and I think it's important to also think, yes, I'm the president or yes, I'm, you know, this, but I can also help in different little positions as well and kind of like help lighten that load. Because if you think of president, you think, oh, they have all of this stuff going on. But really, if you distribute the load yes. and kind of get support for each one, it, it is more manageable as well. Yeah, I agree. I, I really appreciate the uh, the presentation because, uh, you know, I see it as a volunteer and I also see it in my city role um, where neighborhood association presidents, they, you know, they've been doing it for eight or 10 years and it's like, I can't find anybody to step up. Yeah. And, and especially, you know, where, where you have changing demographics, um, how do we, how do we get the, uh, the boards of some of these organizations to become more diverse? Um, and we kind of talked about that as well, uh, Ruth and I, and our engagement starts with us is, right. you know, what we're doing to Thank reach um, Hispanics and, and, you know, well, that's all I, you know, I can, you know, I can reach out to anyone else, but I'd have to have somebody else with that language kind of, you know, join us. But what we've seen is a lot of our neighborhood associations without probably even realizing are stepping up and actually translating everything, having everything in Spanish and English, mm -hmm. you know, if they need that assistance at their meetings, they're calling me or Ruth or somebody and asking for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can you... Have a others coming in? Are they yeah. in yet? Um, Fabiola? Yes. Uh, can you see me? Or yes. I, am I able to hear? Well, I just wanted to add to uh, Ms. Carol uh, her questions that here in El Paso happens the same thing. And it happens because Usually the ones that do not want to leave are the ones that started, started the neighborhood association, the ones that created the bylaws. And it gets like, in first place, they got together because they had an issue to resolve. After the issue has been resolved, uh, everything's, um, everyone is busy, everyone doesn't care so much. And the person that started that uh, neighborhood association continues with a job. But it, it, I usually relate with her and it seems that even if they follow the bylaws, they find a way that, that when it's gonna be the voting, uh, everyone is afraid to take it out, uh, that person, because she's the one that has been leading for so many years and for so many reasons. So I just wanted to add that it not only happened in her place, but everywhere I think in El Paso happens and, and, and usually, those are even the founders of the neighborhood association movement in the city. And, it, and they have uh, earned their respect from all of us that it is hard, it is very hard to take them away because in the first place, they don't wanna relinquish. They want to continue with it. So uh, like Mr. Alrich, I don't have that response. I just wanna feel that it happens everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're exactly right. It, it's this sort of thing that it happens. It's, it's out there. It happens everywhere. I mean, uh, I wish I had the magic answer for you. It's, it's like, um, 
you know, the thing I go back to is, you know, if you're if you're willing to 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 get in, you know, get your hands dirty and 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 try, um, you know, the, the best thing you can can try to pitch to someone is that again, that it's a it's about what's best for the community, and um, you know, you may understand that, you you may realize it, and you may you may see others who you don't think they realize that, and and that's hard. Um, it's very hard. So I see, I'm looking at the questions there. So I see, um, yeah, yeah. Um, when we, what do you want to do yeah. next? Um, information when they. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I, I Like in regards to what? I, I mean, oh, you mean like, maybe you mean, um, um, like if you're an outgoing leader and how do you offer information to an incoming leader, maybe who doesn't want it or, um, so again, you know, th those are hard. I mean, you're, you're talking about dealing with you know, difficult people at this point. Uh, if there's somebody who, you know, doesn't, doesn't want, you, doesn't want the support, um, uh, or, you know, thinks that they've got it. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, right? That's, I mean, the, the, the best thing, you know, that I can tell you is, is, uh, offer, you know, offer any, any information with respect. I'm sure you've heard that a million times this, this conference, you know, offer with respect and, and do it respectfully. And, um, yeah, you know, and this is another part of, of a previous, um, uh, workshop that I saw that, I mean, I, I am a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, there may be a time where for you personally, if, if, if you can't, if you can't get through to someone, I mean, there may be a time for you that you need to, you know, kind of dust your hands off and say, okay, you know, I've done it. I've tried, I've made my best effort. Um, and, you know, move on and, and don't, don't get hung up on that. But um, otherwise just keep at it, perseverance and just, okay. just keep, keep at it. So what can be done when a neighborhood board is just quits holding meetings? Um, uh, and Brenda, I don't know. Do you have any experience with that? <laughs> I mean, we do <laughs> a lot. I figured you did. Um, you know, we, the only thing that when we ask, um, when they were written, the policies were written by council and, and all of that is we only ask you to have one meeting a year. Right. And so a lot of organizations to have more than that, a lot of them do it monthly, which is great right it's great they're engaged they have an agenda each month awesome but sometimes they kind of trickle off and i don't know if it's because they are afraid to ask for help if they're not getting anybody there um so you know if you know that you have that support or try something different you know um a lot of it with the covid a lot of neighborhoods weren't um they didn't feel comfortable doing anything virtual. And so we offered, hey, we can help you with virtual meetings. So it was just kind of like one of those things, you know, like we said, our office isn't just going to show up to your meeting. You have to invite us, you know. Um, we're, you know, people that you invite just like anybody else. Um, but I think just being, being sure that you have someone that you can kind of ask those questions to kind of fall back on so that, like I said, we do this re-engage program a lot in a lot of um, neighborhood associations that may have had other leaders that kind of just trickled off and um, became unregistered. We kind of ask, you know, people are stepping up and saying, hey, how can I redo this, you know, in this, in this neighborhood, in this area? And so we kind of help them brainstorm those, those different methods of doing that. So I hope that that answered your question, but let's go to the next one. Let me see. Um, we have an issue with people wanting to get on the board who have already had issues. How do you, how do you deal with issues that have already had issues? Um, I'm, so again, I'm kind of, I'm reading into it a little bit. I think you, are you, are you saying that, um, the people have had issues, like they've been on in volunteers or on the board in the past, and they <laughs> exhibited issues, and now they're trying to get back on the board. Um, you know, 
Uh, gosh, I don't know. We're in a good. Uh... So, you know, sometimes it starts with conversation, right? Yeah. It's yeah. people are coming yeah. back on the board, which I've had a lot of in different areas. And they're like, well, these people, you know, did this, this, and this. Okay, well, it's time to let's address it. Let's move on past it. And let's see how we can, um, you know, get it, get this together because we're all adults here, right? Um, if we're going to be on a board, we have to know that we can work with other people, right? And so being sure that everyone's in the same, you know, on, on the same level, right? understanding this is what we're here for this is what we're getting done and then just kind of moving on from there um it's understandable that you know some people don't want to work with other people and blah 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 but like i said at the end of the day if you need mediation if you need something else um you know we're definitely appreciative of everyone who volunteers for these positions but at the same time you have to hold your part of the bargain on and be sure that everything is going to be going smoothly right that's all I have on that one. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next one. A big issue in our community is the language barrier. Leadership should reflect the community. I would love for the next president to be Spanish speaking, but that might alienate the non-Spanish speakers. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I hear you. So that is, gosh, it takes a, a very, I'm trying to say, I don't want to say walk the fine line, but, you know, it takes a, a, a real intuition about the, that particular neighborhood, you know, that association or that group that um, it, it is so tough to know when is the right time to, um, I say, make, make that kind of a transition. Um, it, it's, so I, I guess my first thought is, you know, are there other positions that, a, um, you said it was specifically, I'm looking back, you know, uh, Spanish speaking president. So, what, you know, are there other positions that, that, that someone could hold, a Spanish speaker could hold in, in uh, on, like you said, on the board, if you've got multiple positions, you know, there could be some other positions that could be a Spanish speaker. Um, I don't know, that would be my suggestion, you know, sort of slowly work, work into instead of just, you know, I want to see a president be a Spanish speaker, um, you know, find, kind of find, a, find another, another role for the Spanish speaker to, um, and I know it takes the right kind of people, right, but to, to, to it goes, you know, for both ways for um, the, uh, the non-Spanish speakers to get used to trying to communicate, you know, that can be hard, right? And, and get used to communicating with the Spanish speaker and, and kind of vice versa. Um, it takes a lot of grace, you know, when, when you're dealing with, um, when you're trying to work together like that and, and with someone who don't speak the same language, it takes a lot of grace. But that would be my suggestion, you know, try to find a, um, a maybe another, like I said, a board or another leadership position that may not be necessarily the, the president. Um, to get some Spanish speakers involved, but I do agree with you completely that, you know, uh, and we say the same thing with this at, at our church, that we want our church, you know, you want your organization, your to, and in your leadership to, uh, to match, you know, the, the demographics of the community. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's important. I'm trying to let a couple of you in, um, Mr. Where am I? Where am I? Uh, Mr. Kino Wong, you are still on hold, so I'm not sure if you're accepting yet or not, or if it's come through, and Mr. George as well, okay? We're going to move on to the next one for a minute. Thank you for raising your hands and letting, oh, here comes Mr. George. Go ahead. Yes, I appreciate so much everything that I've learned uh, through this, uh, through these meetings, and I've got some great ideas, uh, but I've got to be honest with you. I've got to be honest with you. In my community, I'm currently the president, and I've been president five years or so. But in my community, let's be honest here, it it's going to take somebody that just speaks Spanish. That's all they speak, and they need it's going to add it to really re, uh, represent the folk in my community. If we had a Spanish speaking person that just spoke Spanish, this place would explode. But in the meantime, 
the few folk that still live here that don't speak Spanish and who aren't uh, Mexican American, um, you know, what do you do in that situation? Because that's the reality. I don't. I'm Hispanic, but I don't speak Spanish. My wife does, but I don't. But I, I, I think I guarantee you, if we were to get something started with a person that just spoke Spanish, we we could grow this association. But it would alienate the few folks that are still left here. How do you deal with that situation? Thank you so much. Uh, tough. Tough question to put us on the spot on that one. <laughs> um, you know what I I think what I'm going to go back to is uh, you know celebrating the good, and you know what I'm going to ask is uh, you, I, I get you, you feel very strongly that uh, you need to have a Spanish speaker, and so I think you know, why you got to kind of ask yourself why why do you why do you believe that good thing for the community going forward you know why do you think it's good and, and kind because of the reality it's the reality 80 percent 70 to 80 percent of my community were one square mile bonnie bray here in riverside and uh, you're probably familiar with the area probably 80 percent of the community is hispanic and i think 50 percent don't even speak english but if if, if 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 we could get somebody to get into my position who doesn't even speak English is what I'm saying. Uh, what do you feel about that? Well, I, I do see what you grow. would grow. You know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I do see what you mean because yeah, if you if you uh, you know if you don't speak if you don't speak Spanish, um, you're only English speaking. Then you know your president of the of the neighborhood is uh, only Spanish speaking. Um, yeah, I see what you mean. That could it could alienate. Um, it's like locally localized appetite, you know, like in South Africa, like they used to have in South Africa. Somebody trying to be a leader who who, who doesn't really represent eighty percent of the population or fifty percent at the, at the minimum, you know. Yeah. Well, and trying to connect with um, Spanish-speaking church leaders who speak both. Um, you know, people who work at the schools, teachers, um, different things like that. I don't think necessarily alien, would alienate the English speakers, but they would contribute to both. And that's kind of what we talked about um, in a different setting was being able to be sure that you have someone that translates. There's been a lot of um, neighborhoods that have grown in the Hispanic aspect and they've just tried it, right? They've tried it. They've tried to include, they've tried to, um, keep everything in Spanish and English, do the meetings and ask, Hey, is there anyone here that needs this in Spanish? And they start raising their hands. And so you kind of do that both ways and it kind of starts bringing people like I was talking about earlier. People were like people, some daughters bring their mom, you know, they're older, and they bring their mom and she only speaks Spanish. And it's kind of like, well, I want to, you know, volunteer for this position, but I don't know anything about it. And so just making sure that, that they all have that continuous support and making it simple to follow um, and just kind of going from there. And Mr. George, I'm glad to work with you after this is over because there's so, there's so much that's been going on. And um, I'll be happy to, to, to help you in that in that process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi, Ms. Celia. Hi. Um, just to go along with the gentleman's um, question about this band, uh, our neighborhood is about 60 to 70 percent minority and black, Hispanic, and most of the Hispanics don't speak English. But I'm on the board and I speak Spanish and English. And so there's a lot of times when they will call me directly to, to find out different things. But we've kind of tried to get them engaged. And so now instead of it's come like you were talking about moms bring their daughters. And that's how we've been able to get some of these guys engaged into, you know, it's, it's harder for some of the other cultures, but for us, worked for you know you have you can bridge that language uh, barrier and my other question was we have because we're 
so there's so many minorities in our community. We had a group of people that were trying to get rid of all the minorities, and they spent twenty-one thousand dollars trying to evict all of these people just because they were black and white, black and Mexican, Mexican, uh, Asian. Um, connection came off but we'll move on to the next question and see if she kind of comes back on what advice can you offer in establishing relationships with elected officials yes pardon me could you hear me yes ma'am okay and you so it, at the very it, oh okay i'm sorry so it was it's been really difficult same guys we've been in office for about two and a half years now and we're talking in office because it was some of the lines that they crossed were fair housing lines that they crossed and so how do you how do you handle that when the community has already once voted them out but because no one's wanting to step up to be in those it makes it really difficult. So we can't step down because of it. It's kind of like the other lady was saying, how long do you stay? We, we know it, our time is up, but it's like, if we leave, this is the alternative. So, help. <laughs> Uh, go watch the <laughs> go watch the go watch the recruitment. Uh, uh, I don't know. You know, t tell it. It's like kind of the story you just told us. Um, I feel like I, I feel like you know you got you got to let other people. You got to somehow you know get that same story out to uh, basically the, the, those who aren't willing to volunteer and say you know. We, you know, we did, we were able to do this good thing. Like I said, as an organization, we we're able to do this good thing for our community, for our neighborhood, um, because we stepped up and volunteered and now we're about to step down or we're, you know, we're coming up at, and you know, when, you know, you know, when your, when your elections are, when things start and we're coming up on that and, and we want, we're going to step down and, you know, if, if no one else steps in, I mean, you know, it's, it's almost like, I don't want to say a threat, but, you know, it's telling that story. Um, and, and it's like painting the picture, you know, letting people know what might happen um, if they're yeah. not willing to step up. We had a treasurer that stepped down, and then we had somebody else volunteer. And so we. Her connection's a little bad. We'll see if she comes back on, but we're going to move on. We got about three more minutes. I'm going to move on to a next got up here. Can you give advice on three ways leaders can overcome jealousy from past leaders? Oh, uh, yeah. I saw that one. Um, I'll give at least one. I like how you asked me for three, you know, three ways. Uh, you might, you, you seem like maybe you're a Toastmaster. You know, that's one of the things we teach. You know, you always have three points. Uh, I can tell you, I'll tell you one is um, focus on something else. I mean, if, if you're, if it's, if it's you, you know, and, and you know, I'm having the problem being jealous, um, the best thing I can do is focus my, my attention on something else, you know, take my mind off of uh, that, that whatever it is that's causing me to be jealous. Um, you know, it might be, it depends on right a million situations. It might be that you need to take a break as a leader. You might need to take a break um, in, in some way or another. But it's like focus focus on something else. Um, and again, it's like back to remind yourself of what is the what is the purpose of it all. You know that if the purpose is so in this case, if it's the community and what's best for the community, um, and and you know. Try to try to try to remember that, and just try to remind yourself over and over. That's the purpose. Uh, but mainly, focus on something different. You know, if you're, if you're finding yourself jealous, find something else to <laughs> take up your your space in your brain. 
So we're struggling with some of the neighborhoods where nobody will step forward to be the neighborhood chair. I think your idea of asking one-on-one um, -on -one in advance may work. Good. I hope so. I, and I like that you kind of added that in advance and you're absolutely right. You know, in my, in my this is an example from Toastmasters. We, we sometimes in my club, we kind of wait until like the, the day before the election of officers. And we say, you know, sometimes we just kind of forget and shoot out. Oh, hey, by the way, we need to know if, if anybody's interested in being, uh, you know, running for this office or that. And we wait too late. Um, so you're absolutely right. Again, planning ahead, you know, thinking ahead. Um, and if you can, if you can do that in advance and, you know, like I said, let, letting people know, hey, in, in, in three months or in six months, you know, this is going to come up. This is going to happen. And, and, um, and again, providing people that roles and responsibilities, you know, here they are. And, and so, yeah, do it, do it well in advance. But I hope it helps. As, what advice can you offer in establishing relationships with officials as a new leader within an organization? Um, so I think I think that one of the tough things is that we often see our elected officials as as I mean we we, both, we almost view them as you know up on a pedestal right and we see them as you know, not real people or oh, gosh they must be so smart and they must be so um, uh, so you know so much smarter than me and better than me uh, and and so I think that's that's one piece of advice is just see see an elected official as a real person. Know, a real human being, just like just like you, um, and so you know, see them in that way, and know that they're a real person, and uh, you know, generally find that elected officials also usually they really care about the community. You know, that's 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 one of the reasons that they that they ran for an office is they care. So um, you know, obviously, besides from the obvious, you know, be willing, be, be don't be scared, don't be scared to talk to them and have that conversation, and. Uh, you know, get prepared for it, right? Prepare, write down a few things, write down uh, what it is about your organization, what's good, um, you know, have those things ready to go. Again, if you watch that, the other workshop, the re volunteer recruitment retention, they'll tell you to prepare an elevator pitch. Um, and so that's kind of what I would tell you, you know, be, be ready with that sort of an elevator pitch, what's good about your organization. If you're going to talk to an elected official, why are you going? Is, are you have, do you have a specific request? Uh, make sure that you know what it is, know what you're asking for, and make sure that it's clear. Um, Some of these are kind of more um, of comments to get through them because our time is up. But Ms. Judy Bailey, how about asking them for some advice or mentorship, which we kind of talked about. Um, Mr. Johnny Lewis. Hey, Mr. Johnny, you're with my historic Southside. Have you tried conducting some training sessions? Maybe bring an outside person to conduct the leadership training. So that's a good idea as well, you know, if, if, if they chose to do that. Um, Ms. Fabiola, great advice. Sometimes people just like to feel recognized, which is true. If you're going to be in an organization, you want to be, you know, like involved and engaged and like, hey, this is this is me. How can I help you? Right, um, Dennis. Leaders need to be need to train and encourage people to replace them. It's usually something that isn't done. Have you had that before? Um, encourage people to replace them. <laughs> um, I don't know. Usually, most of my experience has been with. Uh, leaders that are ready to be done and they're they're just waiting for someone to, to come in and, and waiting for someone to step up. It's funny that we have, you know, we have both of those extremes, right? It's like in some organizations, you know, you can't find anybody willing to volunteer for miles around. And then, you know, in others, you got people who won't give it up. Um, gosh, if we could just marry all those both up and we would be perfect. All right. We are going to take some of these questions and your information's on there so JT can get to you um, after 
the session is kind of over. I'm sorry that we didn't have more time um, for some of these questions, but thank you so much for engaging with us. Thank you, JT, for being here. Um, up next are some of the neighborhood pride tours, which I need to get to as well. So thank you so much. And we'll be sure to, if you have any questions, please um, click on JT's name and his email is on there and maybe his phone number. Um, but we'll make sure that he gets these and answers those if we, if we didn't get to answer. I think there might have been one or two. Um, great comments, great questions. Thank you so much again. And that's all I got. You have anything else, JT? I don't. Thank you all so much. Thank y'all and have a great time. Bye.